Excellent. So hello, everyone. Uh, I am Jonah Lakwa. I am executive director of the History Project, and I am so pleased to be here tonight with all of you and with our special guests, Tom and Lorenzo. So thank you so much for being here. Happy Pride, everyone. <laughs> uh, so for tonight's event, um, essentially, we're going to do a bit of conversation about uh, Tom and Lorenzo's book, Legendary Children, The First Decade of RuPaul's Drag Race and the Last Century of Queer Life. And I wanted to introduce you to the History Project first, for those of you who are not already aware of our work, um, and to give you a big welcome from here in Boston. We are Boston's LGBTQ community archives. We document, preserve, and share LGBTQ history. And if you are interested in learning more about us, um, or more about LGBTQ history here in New England, please feel free to check out our website um, or reach out to us directly. Uh, currently, we're working on a project to specifically highlight, document, and share Boston's Black LGBTQ history. So um, please check out how that project proceeds over the summer. And really, without further ado, um, I am absolutely pleased I wrote, I'm so pleased in this introduction about <laughs> 10 times, uh, <laughs> but I'm so pleased to introduce Tom and Lorenzo, uh, who, do you need an introduction? I have one for you, but I feel like. <laughs> I don't feel like we're super famous. I feel like, yeah, no, <laughs> we can fill in our background a little. Perfect. Um, so, so Tom Fitzgerald and Lorenzo Marquez have been a couple for a couple of decades and married for half of one. Uh, in 2006, they took their backgrounds in film, music, fashion, and advertising and launched a gay-themed reality blog called Project Run Gay, which brought them a level of attention and acclaim that might have turned them quite obnoxious had they not been so busy turning that initial outburst of interest into a long-term media and publishing plan. 15 years later, uh, their eponymous website, Tom and Lorenzo, enjoys a readership in the millions, a podcast listened to by tens of thousands every week, two books, a newsletter, and a social media presence that has all combined to successfully recast them from fan bloggers to legitimate fashion and cultural critics. Um, they are the authors of the book we're going to be talking about tonight, Legendary Children, which is a definitive deep dive into queer history and culture uh, with their hit reality show, RuPaul's Drag Race, as a touchstone. Thank you both so much for being here with us Thank tonight. you so much for having us. Yes, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Oh, it is... <laughs> It's our pleasure. Um, so our, our plan for this evening, I have a couple of questions for you. I'm sure that our audience has some questions for you. And uh, since we're in this meeting format, I have us spotlighted, but we can see folks in the audience. So when the time comes, if you're interested in asking a question, we're going to have you do a little hand raise action or pop your question in the chat and we'll read it out loud. And then that way it feels a little bit like we're all here together, even if I'm up here and I'm actually in Quincy. If you two are down there in Philly or close Philly. to Philly. Yeah. Yeah. So here we go. Um, without further ado, uh, my first question for the two of you um, is basically, so this book was released last year to um, a lot of wonderful press and has continued to get really wonderful press. Um, and I was curious, you know, from a, a historian standpoint, how did you decide to write this story as a book? What what brought you to that medium and, and what was really the, the impetus for uh, doing it? Okay, as soon as you started talking, our cat started meowing yeah, in the background. Cats, yeah, probably gonna be, have opinions all night long. So but, sorry about that. Um, the book, uh, the genesis of the book was, well, we were, um, one of the first people to recap RuPaul's Drag Race. We recapped the first episode in February 2009 when it was on Logo and nobody watched it. Um, and I firmly believe that back at, in the day, we were one of only maybe a half dozen people who were talking about the show at that stage. We um, recapped every episode of the show since then and we became known I, you know it's funny because the, the the drag race world has expanded so much in right. the last 12 13 years it was a very tiny pool of people who were talking about it back then and now it's just this massive massive you know there's magazines recap the show every week but um 
when the 10th anniversary of the show rolled around, we did a podcast, just looking back on how the show has changed and how times have changed. And uh, because that is one of the more interesting things about Drag Race is uh, when you look at the first season and when you look at, like, for instance, All Stars just dropped today, All Stars 6, the difference in quality, the difference in tone, everything about it has changed so, so much. Even and those the, even the concept of it, it completely changed. Right. And and those changes reflect certain things about the changes in our culture, the changes in the LGBTQ community. So we did this podcast talking about all this stuff. And it was our agent, our book agent, who called me up at the gym that afternoon. I was we had recorded the podcast, uploaded it, and I went off to go work out. And she called me and she was like, I listened to today's podcast. And why don't you guys pitch a book about drag race? And um, Lorenzo, we don't, secret to our marriage, we both belong to different different gyms. We never work out together. So I immediately texted him at his gym and I was like, oh my God, Monica just had the best idea. So uh, it was an, like a light bulb going off over our heads. I was like, of course we should write a book about drag race. And then uh, the reality sets in and there have been about I don't know, two dozen books written about Drag Race, various fan guides and trivia guides and quotation guides and that sort of thing. And um, we thought, well, maybe we could do something a little more definitive, maybe, you know, since we've been there since day one. And the original proposal for the book was very close to a fan guide, except we kept working in bits in the proposal about how the show reflects certain things about queer culture and LGBTQ history and all that. So it when my our agent shopped it around and um, uh, as to we weren't surprised that a lot of people didn't bite because they said, well, there's already a, you know, the market's flooded on books about drag race. But one editor at Penguin, Elda Roeder, uh, got back to our agent and she said, I really like the way these guys talk about queer history and work it into the show. Do they do you think they could do something with that? And our agent came back to what I've always been. We've always been very open about this because I think people should understand that um, books are not they don't will always spring fully formed from some writer's brow. There is a process and sometimes agents are involved in that process and sometimes editors are involved in a lot of opinion and a lot of opinion. So this, this our agent came back to us with this note from the editor. and We thought, oh, my God, that is such a great idea. And it was just exciting because uh, I think every queer writer wants some someone to say, hey, how, how about you guys write about Stonewall? You know, like that just the, the thought of getting to write about these things that someone would want us to write about it and, and do right. some sort of comprehensive book. So we immediately put together another proposal. It was the quickest, easiest thing we ever wrote and sent it off. And that's that's ex- the proposal that we sent. The second one is absolutely what the book wound up being. I actually looked at the proposal the other night and I I was actually a little surprised. I was like, wow, this this is exactly what the book wound up. Because a lot of times proposals are proposals and then the final product is something that goes through changes. But that is it. It was a, a combination of a lot of people, uh, several people giving us advice. Uh, the fact that we knew the show really well and had tracked the changes in the show that you know reflected certain things in 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 society i guess and we also had a really good base understanding of queer history it has been a hobby of ours for years and um we have one full bookcase in our living room that probably has 75 to 100 queer cultural history books of various types and Um, and as the the show became more popular, um, we noticed because we we're always on social media, we noticed that people were, were talking about the show, but not really getting all the references. Uh, and we're like, that's it. You know, we, we need to teach the, these children, teach the children. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, we need to teach them, you know, and because RuPaul would say something, a, a drag queen would say something and you could tell that they didn't know what they were talking about. They would completely miss it. So that was great. I mean, it was a, the, the best combo. Um, to write a book. Yeah, that was sort of the um, the the story of the show in small is that, you know, it started out on Logo. Uh, it was clearly pitched to a gay male audience. I can s- distinctly remember all the commercial breaks were for things like AIDS meds and leather gear stores uh, and lube, and we, you know, which we loved. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But um, then it it moved over to VH1 and it got a much broader audience. And right. that's when you started seeing the fandom explode. And it was a lot of um, 
queer allies watching the show who might not know their queer history. And it was a lot of kids. And that was really what we wanted the book to be when we when when it came to that, when it evolved to the point where it eventually is what it became. We wanted to address the young people. We went to DragCon the year before the book came out and not to sound grandiose, but I we looked out on the floor and it was I mean, the average age on the floor was maybe 18. And I said, this is it. This is who we're writing the book for. All these kids walking around in pink feather boas who don't know who Marsha P. Johnson was, you know, or didn't see Paris is burnt. Like, don't get the Paris is burning references on the show. Um, that that was it. That's who we wanted to. It's, write the, it's book the for. perfect guide for to enjoy the show even more, because then you get all the references. And at the same time, you learn a lot of history, queer history. Also. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so we had talked about not reading from the book because it's a little awkward on zoom but i had flagged so i have the book here i've been using it in my uh historical research to come up with questions for tonight um and something that really struck me is right in your introduction that you say that the story of rupaul's drag race is the same as the story of the lgbtq political and cultural movement of the past half century you can't separate one for the other and that i know even as somebody who's really mired in queer history all the time, impressed with the references and notes that you're making to connect to sometimes one-off references that a drag queen makes on the show. Right. Um, and so I was going to ask you, you know, as LGBTQ people, how did you learn your drag history? Um, and especially as you're imparting that history onto the future, what are some of those um, references that we should all know that we should all be uh watching the originals of uh what should we know when we watch drag race or what should we know just I, generally i'm doing that thing where you're only supposed to ask one question in an interview and i'm asking two because i'm so okay. excited about both of them the first question is how did you get interested in in lgbtq history generally oh oh this goes i mean i'll start with me right, but right. I, honestly i think it was something we developed we've been together 25 years and I think um, I think that interest developed side by side. The two of us were reading different books. Well, for instance, Lorenzo is an expert on uh, physique magazines of the 1950s, which we actually devoted part of a chapter about the pit crew to that. Uh, but he has all these reference books and everything. He actually collects the old magazines. I um, I always had a fascination with um, the. Uh, the gay male social scene and the gay male sexual mm -hmm. scene, like the the rise of things like bathhouses in cities in America and um, the rise of certain um, social conventions within the gay male community. Like, uh, and we talk about these in the book, like the Castro clone and that sort of thing. In terms of drag, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I went, uh, my earliest forays out into the queer world when I was a young man were drag shows. And I think that actually is, we tried to get to that in the book that for so many people for so long, going to a drag show was like one of the first things they did as a queer person. Right. That's why drag, I feel drag is so important. And as we note in the book, you know, like there was a drag queen at Stonewall, there was a drag queen at Pulse. There's drag queens everywhere in our history. Right. Um, but yeah, like a lot of queer people i just fell in love with drag queens i fell in love with the magic of it i fell in love with the power of it i fell in love with for years i used to tell a story long before drag race was on the air of sitting on the front steps of my apartment building when i was a young gay man having a cigarette i don't smoke anymore but it was three o'clock in the morning it was the night of halloween and we i lived right down the street from the gay bar area and I watched Joan Crawford and Elizabeth Taylor beat the crap out of each other with their purses. It was two drag queens getting into a fight in the middle of the street. And I just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Um, I, I was always fascinated by the fact that drag queens um, are beautiful, but also intimidating. Right. There's something very intimidating when you, well, I mean, because they're like seven feet tall, a lot of them, their makeup is so strong and powerful. And I, I think I always responded to that, that idea of being beautiful and so strong that it's it's intimidating to see that in, and to see to be gender nonconforming on top of it. All of that 
felt so powerful to me as a young man. So yeah, I always loved I always loved drag. I don't right. know about you. No, it's pretty much the same. I mean, you have to remember that back then, uh, it wasn't so much online. You know, you actually had to go to a bar. You right. actually had to go to a drag show uh, to enjoy it. So I remember being surrounded by drag queens and I was so young, I still remember one of the drag queens said, what is this child doing here? Because <laughs> uh, I was so young, but I wanted to be there. I, I would hide, you know, because you, you, I wasn't allowed to be there because I was underage. But anyway, I was just fascinated with that world. And as it keeps expanding in your head and more interest, you know, you get more and more interested in it, you start wanting to know more about them and about the history and all that. So you start reading about it and, and then you, you know, you, you start learning why things are the way they are and, and you just become more fascinated by it uh, every in, day. In terms of the second part of your question, like who people should know. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I think, I think there's the, you know, who are the cast of characters in your, your book? Who do you think we should know? Can you tell us about some of them? Sure, sure. They're, uh, first off, they're all on the front and back cover of the book. Yeah. The, uh, after the book was written, um, our editor uh, told us about this artist, Shane Gillard, who has a fantastic Instagram, where he does these comic book covers of um, classic comic book covers with famous people from queer history in them. And so they proposed this. And I've been a comic book nerd for 40 years. So I was thrilled that, that my book was going to look like a classic comic book. And they asked us, they said, who do you want on the cover? And we, almost immediately, we came up with that, that list of names mm -hmm. that you see on the cover. So who do people need to know? I'm looking at the cover right now. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> Sylvester, Gladys Bentley, right. uh, Marsha P. Johnson, Lee Bowery, Crystal LaBeja, Hibiscus, Jackie Shane, Sylvia Rivera, Doris Fish, um, Divine, uh, Tim Curry as Frankenfurter. And on the back cover, you have Hector Extravaganza and Lip Sinka. Uh, now, these, these people were all chosen for various reasons. First, uh, I wanted to, we wanted to make sure that uh, the cover of the book and the contents of the book were not only um, racially and ethnic, ethnically diverse, but that we would be featuring um, transgender women, transmasculine figures, uh, bisexual figures, lesbians, as much as possible, we were going to put all every color and shade of the queer rainbow in the book, which is ironic because drag race itself has always had problems in terms of representation. It's always mm -hmm. focused way too much on white cisgender men in dresses or basically cisgender men in dresses. And, um, we wanted to make sure that that's not what the book was going to be, right? And we wanted to, people to see that on the cover, like Gladys Bentley in her top hat, you know what I mean? And 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 Frankenfurter, who's, you know, was pansexual and pangender before we even had those terms. Um, but those are the people that I feel not only created queer culture as we know it, but um, pushed it out into the mainstream and then and affected the mainstream, like Divine and Tim Curry are incredibly influential figures, right, right up there with RuPaul. And not only the, the queer history, but also uh, history and culture in general. I mean, if you look at these people on the cover, they all are incredible, talented, uh, everything, actors, singers, you know, uh, dancers and and musicians and and fashion political and figures political sylvia figures. rivera marcia p johnson so they they have they gave so much to the community not just the queer community but the you know the, the world in general there's a main thesis to the book there's a couple but the i think the main one is that um the queer art queer culture all of it arose out of oppression shade and and the gay male beauty ideal we touch on all of these things lip syncing you know the history why why do drag queens lip sync because musicians wouldn't play in gay bars and right. without you know charging exorbitant prices so it was cheaper to put on records and get some queen who can and that you know that's oppression right why why is there shade because african-american women and trans women and gay men used it as a social weapon to establish dominance and control control in, a, in situations where they were in danger um, because shade, you know, it was a street thing. And when you talk, when you go say pre Stonewall and you're talking about black trans women, you're talking about sex workers, like 90% of the time you're because there were no other options for them. And they were literally on the street and they created this form of humor 
and form of social address that we now, you know, that's the library challenge on Drag Race. So um, all of these people that are on the cover that we've mentioned, they all had journeys or contributions or setbacks that reflect the history of queer culture and queer life in the last hundred years. That's why they were chosen. Beautiful. That is Thank a you. perfect answer. <laughs> um, and it's such a, a wonderful, like you said, it's a wonderful cast of characters. You really are showing a broad diversity of people. It's not all impersonators or singers or they're all people right. who have made really strong um, or had a really strong effect on, on what is now drag culture and queer culture kind of generally. Yes. Um, the question that I sort of botched asking before was, uh, you have a list of suggestions for further reading and watching, which again, as a historian, I love. I love sources, I love citations. I can go back and do more research myself. Um, for folks who are picking up the book for the first time and finish it, what would you suggest next? Like what are some of the um, most important sort of cultural touchstones that people should go and experience? Uh, number one would have to be Paris is Burning. Yes. It's, um, and we tried to contextualize the film a couple of times in the book to, to make people understand that, you know, there are critics of this film, uh, specifically uh, black people have, have, people in that community, black people and, and uh, Latinx people in the ball community, especially from that time, did not feel that the film um, elevated them as much as they would have liked. People felt that money was made off of them. Uh, other critics, I know, uh, like Bell Hooks wrote a piece that that really took it to a task for having, because the filmmaker is a white lesbian. Mm -hmm. Uh, and colonialist attitude to it. And you you see Ryan Murphy's post is very much a response to Paris is Burning that tried to uh, sort of correct the sort of tragic ghetto undertones of Paris is Burning by showing a much more triumphant uh, ball scene of that period. But problematic as the film might be as a documentary, you cannot uh, take away its power as a document. Right. Um, where else are you going to see Pepper LaBeja talk about, you know, being a mother to her house? Right. Um, well, the fact that the, the movie is so raw because they didn't have, they had a very low budget. Right. And, um, you really get to see a lot that you probably wouldn't see if it was a more polished, more, you know, clean version. Right. Of their life. Um, so that would be number one. And I also feel we we've told people this, you know, when we've talked about the book in the past, one of the values of looking at old older uh, documentaries and footage of uh, trans women in the drag scene is to see the difference of what it was like to live as a trans woman then versus what it's like to live as a trans woman now. One of the things that came up in the history of, in the research of the book, you're researching all of these drag queens and trans women from the 60s and the 70s, and they, so many of them um, died young, and a lot of them died of liver failure or liver cancer, and part of that was because they were buying street hormones. And um, because, you, you know, it was that it was so much more difficult for them to get any sort of help in their in their transition. And I want people to understand that when they look at things like because a lot of people in Paris is burning did die young and they didn't all die of AIDS. Some of them did die of like liver problems and cancer and other illnesses. And I think it's important to see that it's great that Pose gives you that more glamorous version of the ball community and certainly uh, the ball community today is so vibrant, such an art form, and it, it's all over the world. But at that time, I think it's very important to look at Paris is Burning in, in the context of the height of the AIDS crisis and the height of the crack epidemic. Um, so that's number one. The Queen. The Queen. I was going to talk about the Queen. Yes, definitely the Queen. I mean, it came out in 1968 uh, when you could go to jail for just dressing as a woman. Um, uh, so, and, and it's such a great uh, uh, example and, and of, of what happened at the time, you know, participating in all kinds of things uh, like the pageantry, uh, you know, and all that. And then all of a sudden, nobody was expecting it. And then you have Crystal Abasia, you know, uh, get into a fight with the other contestant and, and, and becoming this iconic moment that meant so much right. for a lot of people. And not only that, she she after that she went and 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 created something completely different to support her cause and and all she that. She created 
the modern ball scene. Yes, but uh, yeah, the Queen. Um, it's a seminal. Uh, it, it was made at a time when no one was actually filming drag queens, right. and as Lorenzo said, it was illegal for them to be drag queens at the time. And what I find fascinating about, uh, well, first off, the Crystal LaBeija portion of the uh, of the documentary really illustrates right. a problem that has plagued the community since before Stonewall and for the next 50 years, which was uh, the centering of white people in the queer community and the marginalizing of people of color. And, and I mean, LaBeija's whole scene addresses that. Right. Uh, and the fact that that is like a precursor to, you know, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera having the same arguments. Um, but another thing I found fascinating about it was all of the scenes of these mostly white, because the film mostly followed the white drag queens, middle class gay men, cis gay men in their hotel rooms, uh, practicing and polishing their pumps and putting on their eyelashes and everything. And it is old school drag. Like it is not the kind of drag you see on drag. Race. I just think it's fascinating to watch these men um, do it no matter what. I yeah. mean, it's illegal. You, you can go to jail, but you're still doing it. You're still in front of a camera because you believe in it so much and you really want to do it. So I, I, I just love that. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful to watch. Further suggestions, of course, are the films of John Waters, um, especially the early films with Divine. Uh, if we're talking about Drag Race, and if we're trying to connect everything to Drag Race, the reason Divine's on the cover and we devoted time to John Waters is because their work really is reflected in the show. Uh, every comedy sketch challenge right. is arises out of that sort of trash cinema style of acting. Uh, they don't, you know, they never critique the queens for not, you know, you didn't get in touch with their character. They want the queens to be completely over the top every time. They want them to be completely ridiculous. And the most ridiculous um, performance usually wins that challenge. And, and to us, that's just paying homage to Divine and John Waters every time they do it. And it's just, I mean, my God, like female trouble and pink flamingos. You, you can't talk about the way queer culture moved into the mainstream in the latter half of the 20th century. You can't talk about that without talking about those films. Right. I mean, in talking about pumping up the volume and, you know, in creating this real camp atmosphere and which, you know, what that's what- Camp starts with an almost right. like aesthetic, which uh, was what made it so exciting and so fun. It, because it wasn't like, you know, Pink Flamingos wasn't showing you the kind of drag in the queen. It wasn't that sort of pageanty kind of drag. It was shocking drag, and it actually elevated drag. Like no one was doing it like Divine, like that face. But there's usually one queen per season of Drag Race who's got like Eureka, who who or Trixie Mattel even, who takes some of those extreme makeup effects that Divine pretty much pioneered, uh, and. And they're considered mainstream now. And that goes back to what I said about the book. I mean, if you read the book and you get all these references, then you can understand why the queens do what they do. I mean, uh, um, uh, well, who was it? Uh, Raj? Uh, Raja? I forget. Uh, he did the Crystal of Asia uh, snatch game. Uh, Raja. 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 It was a yeah. Aja. Aja. Aja, yes. Yeah. Raja. Raja. Thank you, Aja. I mean, that was such a wonderful moment. <laughs> and I remember the next day, everyone going online and I went on YouTube and, and I could see the comments on YouTube say, oh, I'm here because of Drag Race. I'm here because of Drag I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Because they didn't know who Crystal Abasia was. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, further... I think that's... Mm -hmm. go, oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'll say... just say further research. If I wanted to get away from music and, and, and uh, acting is uh, I... Uh, have such a great love for Lee Bowery. And again, he was one of those boundary pushers in drag who um, changed it forever. And uh, he made drag shocking. He took whatever uh, Divine was doing on film and he turned it into performance art and yeah. pushed the boundaries even further. And in doing so, he influenced the world of fashion yes. tremendously. Exactly. And fashion designers are still taking from his you know, work. So uh, and that's what I meant by uh, these queer folks influencing not the queer, not just the queer world, but the world in general. I mean, yeah. you have Lee Bowery, inf you know, you have Alexander McQueen, you know, major, major designing, totally influenced by Lee Bowery and so on. So that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I was just going to say, you know, there's 
something that I, I'm constantly keeping in mind. It's not like when you come out or when you decide to watch Drag Race that someone hands you a guide and says, here's everything you need. I mean, now they, I mean, now they can hand you a guide. <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you have to do this research yourself. And it is so nice now with the internet that you can go to YouTube, that you can go to the Digital right. Transgender Archive right. and look up some of these pioneers and learn more about their life in a way that is totally way more accessible than it was even five to 10 years ago. Yeah, um, great. And I mean, I there's no, mm-hmm. go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, there's no way you can read about uh, Jackie Shane and, and not watch one of her videos. I mean, you have to go on YouTube and watch the beauty of it. Right. You know, just great voice, great performance. And it's just doing it back when nobody else was doing. That's what we need to remember. Right. Uh, we're talking about people doing things that a, were illegal to do and B, they just felt that they had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was going to say there's, and I think this might also be in the introduction, the suggestion to read the book with one hand so you can Google with the other, Yeah. Um, which sounds dirty now that I say it out loud, but <laughs> I know, uh, it was nice I, I know, I know, <laughs> uh, but oh well, it really, it makes it such a, a an interesting experience. I'm digging myself into a hole. Um, so we do have some questions in the chat from folks and um, people have been messaging me. If you wanna put your questions directly in the chat publicly, uh, feel free and I can read them out. Um, sort of as we, we head a little bit further in, if you want to um, ask a question out loud, I can unmute you. So just raise your hand to do that if you wanna participate from the audience. Um, but the first question I got from, uh, an audience members from Pat, and they're asking, yes. do you think Legendary on HBO reflects a new evolution of ballroom culture, something that's more diverse racially and in terms of non-binary identities? I haven't watched Legendary yet, so I don't know too much about it, but have you? Yes, we have mm-hmm. watched it. Um, well, for one, I mean, ballroom culture has always celebrated trans women and uh, gender nonconforming people. Um, so what you're seeing is it's not so much an evolution. It's it's a mainstreaming, actually, mm-hmm. of ballroom culture. Um, Legendary is a fantastic show. The creativity on that show is off the chain. The uh, people who are competing on that show are just tremendous artists and amazing to watch. Mm-hmm. But much like Drag Race, I don't, you know, it's risking narrowing the definition of something that um, started out in an underground situation and grew. You know, I, I, it's not my place to criticize ball culture, especially as a white cis man who who doesn't partake in it, or to criticize the show. But there is uh, this risk of mainstreaming ball culture in a way, in the same way that Drag Race is sometimes criticized for, in that you are, I mean, ball culture is so broad and so wide and and encompasses so many styles and so many lifestyles and so many people. Um, And what you're seeing on Legendary is a very, very glamorized, very, very, um, the people who are competing on that show have money. They have the money for the costumes, the money for the rehearsals and the choreography. Um, They may not be wealthy people, but, you know, they are devoted, much like the drag race queens that compete on drag race, they have devoted a lot of time and money to their careers. So it is extremely high level ball culture. Um, One of the things that is in the back of the book for suggested, uh, you know, further suggestion of exploration is to go and look at the incredible archives of ball, um, of all the balls that are on YouTube. There are entire channels that will update every week with the previous weekend's balls. And that's the best way to really see what ballroom is happening, what it's like in, you know, D.C., what it's like in Philly, what it's like in Baltimore, what it's like in Berlin. You can find all of that on YouTube, and that gives you a much broader definition. I really don't want to sound like I'm coming down on Legendary because I think it's an amazing show. Much like Drag Race, it's a culmination. I mean, believe me. Pepper LeBeige never thought the world would have a show like this, you know? Uh, so it's a good thing that that Legendary is on. But um, I don't know that it's necessarily expanding ball culture as it is showing a, a slightly narrow 
version of it. I think it's 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 a great way to get an introduction, you know, and then go on, for example, YouTube and, and watch all these videos. Uh, because you, the ball community, they're, they're still doing work for the community. I mean, it's not just the show, the fantasy, the costumes and everything. They still do a lot of work as they did in the back, back when uh, they they shot uh, Paris is Burning. Um, they still do a lot of work for the community. They help every each other. They help the queens. They, you know, they they do a lot socially and politi politically. There's a lot of political activism yes. in the ball yes. scene. There's a lot of- Today, I mean, right um, now. Healthcare activism in the ball scene because, you know, marginalized people always have healthcare right. needs that are not properly addressed. So- So um, that, that's what we mean by- Saying what we're saying about legendary is the same thing with drag queen. Drag queen is fantastic. I mean, drag queen, drag race is fantastic. Uh, it's showing the world a a world that they didn't know a lot, a lot of them. But that that's you have to still remember that it's not everything. You know, drag race is not everything. It's right. not the entire world. And neither is legendary. Same thing with legendary. And neither is close to the right. All of them. places on the pie. Right. They're great introductions, but they're a TV show. You know. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's totally different than going to like, um, and now I'm trying to remember the the name of the competition that we have here in Boston for drag queens that takes place weekly where you see people like really pushing the boundaries. I mean, when Cassia was here doing Perestroika at Jacques Cabaret <laughs> many years ago now at this point, several years ago, um, there's a video of her on, on YouTube floating around lip syncing to uh, My Heart Will Go On in Russian and another queen comes in as an iceberg and oh, she oh sinks God. her ship and she ends up spitting water <laughs> all over herself in the stage and the audience. And like, you're not going to see that on RuPaul's no. Drag Race. No, of course not. But, you're not. but you're going to see it if you if you go to the clubs, if you see it in person. Right. Um, uh, and, and I also encourage people to go to the to the clubs and to go see them perform because a lot of these people depend on the money they make performing. Right. Uh, and you should support them. If you like drag, if you like the way they perform, uh, you should support them at a real club um, because they need the money. Yeah, and that's Andrew in the chat is also mentioning Katya lip syncing to memories from cats in Russian in a litter box. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, that's, that's not going to happen on, on Rue's stage. But it no, no, you, you, you just say Katya doing something very bizarre. And that's it. <laughs> it's uh, hometown Queens. So oh my God, uh, we love her. Yeah, there, there is a comment in the chat from uh, Colin Jack that links to an article about Junior LeBeja basically explaining why he didn't get involved in the television side of things or the, the Hollywood side of things. So I'll send that to folks later so you can read it. Um, and yeah, so let's see, there was another question actually about Rue that I got in the chat. And um, the question is, does RuPaul know about the book and has he commented on it? We have reached out several times. Um, we reached yeah. out, our agent reached out to his agent. We wrote a letter to him. And uh, bear in mind that um, we interviewed RuPaul the first season of the show. And I just want to say, Ru was so thankful that we were paying attention to his little drag show because nobody was paying attention to it at the time. Um, but we could not. Uh, Ru. I don't want to ban through, but um, I believe that Rue was very protective of his brand, and I don't think he's particularly particularly in love with anyone who tries to cash in right. on Drag Race's success, which is how he may have read this book. It's mm -hmm. not was not our intention behind the book, but no, Rue has not commented. We have asked several times. We've reached out to World of Wonder several times. They are very protective of their brand, so no. I would love it. I we would we would have loved it if Rue had given it his seal of approval. Right. But um, and we'll leave it at that. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, another question from Philip in the chat is about the popularization of drag race and sort of conversations around gender expression. And do you think that? I, I think what this question is asking: Do you think that uh, more representation on TV has led to? more people, especially, you know, Gen Z's starting to identify as non-binary or finding new terms to use to describe themselves. Do you see that as a part of the impact of drag race? I think, um, I think it's a little hard to measure how much of that is drag race and how much of that was going to happen without drag race. Sure. Um, the, the 
rise in transgender advocacy and activism, as well as the rise in the what we call the questioning of the binary, um, that really gained power and force after gay people got the right to marry. <laughs> and so this this was going to happen post uh, gay marriage rights because that's exactly how it was framed by trans advocates. They basically said, OK, you guys got what you wanted. We need you all to fight for us. Yeah, sure. And their voices became louder. Their voices became more centralized in the queer press, thankfully. And um, it allowed for this conversation to start spilling over into the mainstream. So Drag Race benefited from that, but I think they also accelerated that because um, they were, you know, Drag Race, once it was discovered by kids, once it was, uh, it expanded beyond the initial gay male audience that it was appealing to, uh, what you had was kids and teenagers really seeing the binary being totally shot to hell right in front of them on television. And that allowed a whole generation of kids. I mean, how many drag queens compete on Drag Race who um, their first drag queen they ever saw was on Drag Race, you know, because the show's been on so many years that it was Drag Race that made them get into drag. Right. Um, now, now expand that out to the hundreds of thousands or millions of kids who are watching the show. Imagine what effect that is having on their psyches. The, you know, the... You know, just the it's telling them it's telling a whole generation of kids that it's OK to, you know, not call yourself one or the other. It's OK to express, you know, your, you know, yourself in any way that might not seem right for your gender. Um, and then over time, the show, of course, has run into some controversy over the years, over the years, because Rue has not always been great about the when he talks about trans people in drag. He's not great. And he got into a couple of kerfuffles over the years because and we again we talked about that in the book it's very it was very much a queen of his generation and uh he felt he wrongly felt that there was a separation between the style of drag that he does and the style of drag that trans women do it, he was completely wrong about that yeah. but mm -hmm. the show evolved and now like all stars six is on the air and there's Jiggly Caliente and uh, Kylie Sunny Glover both in the cast. They're both trans uh, and they both transitioned. And the show was much more open about that sort of thing. We just had got Mick in the previous uh, regular season of the show, right. which really blew open, you know, the doors wide open because got Mick is a trans man. Um, so uh, all of these things are combining, but um, it, it, Drag Race benefited, like I said, benefited from all of this happening, but also pushed it at the same time. Right. Yeah, I think they both benefited from each other. Yeah. Also, the fact that the show became so popular that it, there was no way to, to go back. I mean, you had to go forward right. and, and include everybody right. and expand. I mean, that was just the way it, it had to be. We always point out that when you watch the early seasons of the show, it's a little shocking what some of the things the judges said. Right. Where like Michelle Visage would be like, you're giving me boy in a dress. And you wouldn't, you just wouldn't, wouldn't hear that, that now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You wouldn't hear um, fish, the fishy, you're serving me fish. Like you just don't hear that anymore. And that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. Um, even the term realness, you don't necessarily hear all that much anymore because the show has expanded its understanding that drag is not simply um, cis men mimicking uh, women. There's all kinds of drag out there and the show is slowly slowly starting to, you know, encompass that. And so uh, speaking of All-Star 6, a question we had from, from Cole and Jack was, who's your All-Star 6 pick? Have you decided yet? Will you no, tell I us haven't publicly? decided yet. Yeah. We haven't even finished. We, I watched the first and I'm halfway through the second episode. Um, I mean, I, I have a soft spot for Pandora, but I also think she's been around on the merry-go-round a few too many times um i do like akira davenport i like raja o'hara um i yes. still like eureka and i oh you know who i love is ginger minch yes um what talk about an all-around old school queen who can do it all she's comedy she's got an amazing voice and she's and she's an actor i mean she acts on top of everything i would love there's a lot of plus size queens in this year's crop and the all-stars crop and I, they really need because silky ganache is in it as well 
they really need to give the crown to a plus size queen after all this time, right. especially since, again, divine. Hello. I mean, plus size drag queens have a long history of being some of the most popular drag queens in history. The fact that drag race can't seem to reward any of them is a pretty bad thing. So if I had to, I would probably say Ginger Minge. I really do love Ginger Minge. It sounds well, dirty, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's I think most of these topics do. Um, and, and folks are saying, I'd love a Ginger win. Um, oh, yeah. She's great. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so, yeah, a plus size girl for the win. Another comment that's from my wife from downstairs. Hi, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> I know we are excited uh, to see Lawrence Cheney win in the UK. Sorry if I spoiled right. it. We still hasn't seen. But we were like, finally. Yeah. Um, so I agree with you. Uh, there uh, are a couple of other questions in the chat. Like, folks, please, I encourage you if you're you're thinking. Yeah, anything we'll answer else, anything. You know, unfettered access. Um, one question that I thought was really fun, actually, was what would your dream biopic for Ryan Murphy to produce and or direct be? If we had a direct line to, to Ryan Murphy's oh, next oh, career history see. project. Of these people, who would we want him to direct? Or anybody. Anybody, whoever. Um, yeah, you know my pick. Uh, go ahead. Who's your I pick? I would go with Bob Meiser. Um, oh. I think he... Explain who Bob Miser is. Bob Miser was a photographer back in the 40s uh, and 60s and 60s and 70s uh, who took pictures of all these uh, bodybuilders at the time, especially back in the 40s and 50s. And he pretty much created the whole genre, the whole, you know, 40s porn, I, I should he say. He was the Hugh Hefner of gay erotica. Right. He created a magazine and then and he produced all these photographs that, you know, back then, again, you could go to jail. You could you could go to jail if you took the picture, if you were in the picture, if you bought the magazine, if you sold the magazine. So anyway, everybody could go to jail, but they they kept doing the magazine. And the magazine created an incredible community, created an, an incredible uh, way of communicating, or of just having all these people all over the country uh, united uh, and and you know reading this magazine and and communicating. And they had ads, they had all kinds of things. So. Bob Miser, I think he, he he's great. My pick would be Hibiscus, oh, who yeah. was the San Francisco yes, drag, yes, hippie yes. drag queen. What I love about Hibiscus' story, number one, is that when you try, we tell his story in the book, and when you look at the story of his life, the people that he crossed paths with in his career and the, the things that he managed to do from, from the underground uh, were pretty amazing. Right. Um, but I also think that's a side of drag that uh, a side of drag history uh, yeah. that has not been um, hasn't gotten its due. Number one, uh, San Francisco drag does not get its due on the national stage. Drag race does not do a good job of yes. uh, centering San Francisco Queens and showing the difference between uh, uh, San Francisco drag and other drag. And Hibiscus is a, just a prime example of that. Just this total hippy dippy queen from the '60s, putting glitter and flower in his and flowers in his beard, and and doing these weird underground like cabaret shows. And his drag was trash picked. He would wear bras made out of pineapples, and you know, a totally different take on drag. It wasn't glamour. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't fashion it was underground and it had a very political undertone to it and i guess we can use this language it was pure gender fuck drag i mean it was not men look, trying to look like women it was uh queer people looking like crazy clowns <laughs> up on stage and sometimes that meant dresses and other times it meant whatever the hell they could pick out of you know the costume shop dra uh, trash or whatever. Again, it goes back to what I said, that it's, it's, a, it's a drag representation that you don't see on the show. Yeah. And it's and it's part of our culture. Yeah. Uh, and it's very much part of the uh, San Francisco history. Yeah. I mean, if you look, San Francisco, San Francisco uh, contributed so much to the queer history. There's so many things that happened at, back then. Absolutely. And so um, one of the, the questions that's come up in the chat a few different times is what would your drag names be? Oh have my gosh! You know, I, I saw the question. I, I like, saw that. Yeah. Like, I have no, <laughs> I have idea. no idea. Uh, <laughs> I have a great thumb. Yeah, we're we maybe we'll come back to that. But I, 
It's weird. I never gave it any. No, I never gave it. No one's ever asked. I like I like very clever names. Like my favorite is Virginia Ham. You know that to me is just such a great name. I like names like that. Right, right, right. I can't come up. I like I wouldn't be able to come up. I'm no. sorry. Oh I, yeah. Maybe it's, by the time we're done, I'll come up with something. Um, okay. Maybe. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh. <laughs> Somebody said there's a Shalina buffet. I know. Um, I've heard Fatsy Klein before, which I oh love. My God. Oh my God. Um, but we'll we'll come back to that one. Okay. Um. To jump back to history, was there anything or any part of the culture that you wanted to include in the book that you had a hard time either finding information about or um, that, you know, w- was difficult to, to source? Yes. Uh, the chapter on lip syncing. Yes. Mm-hmm. It was the last chapter of the book we wrote. And we did write the book mostly in order, but that is not the last chapter in the book. Uh, and it was... We knew there was going to be a chapter on lip syncing because we had pegged the the entire book was each chapter was going to be a segment on Drag Race and then we were going to relate it to, you know, so there's chapters on the Snatch Game and on the Library Challenge and on the Runway and all that stuff. So we and lip syncing is such a huge part of the show. So we knew there would be a chapter on lip syncing. And for the longest time, I was we were both like, oh, my God, I don't know what this is what it's going to be. I don't know what the hook is going to be. And I can remember we were getting our taxes done. It was like tax week and we were at our accountant's office and I cannot handle that business at all. I'm always like, Lorenzo, you go sit with her, answer all her questions. I'm going to sit out here. It just raises my stress we, levels. We have very complicated taxes. <laughs> so, yeah, we're bloggers. So I remember I was sitting in our accountant's waiting area while Lorenzo was in there signing all the papers, frantically doing research. And I found a um, thesis paper online. Uh, it was actually a, it wasn't the whole, it was a uh, an excerpt from it. Uh, but it sent me off on a whole bunch of uh, other, you know, it sent me off and I was able to do uh, further research. And the paper was about what I alluded to earlier about um, why lip syncing became a drag thing in drag clubs. And it specifically referenced the Garden of Allah in Seattle, which was a famous, Uh, queer bar in Seattle in in the 1940s and the 1950s. And it eventually got closed down because the musicians unions, um, it wasn't just homophobia. They weren't just asking exorbitant prices because they didn't want to pay play for gay clubs. They were asking those exorbitant prices because those clubs were constantly raided and these musicians were in danger of going to jail. So they would say to these bar owners, if you want us to play for your drag queens, you're going to have to pay through the nose for it. And eventually the Garden of Allah went out of business and it was this legendary bar and it went out of business for that reason. That's what this this paper was about. And that sent us off on a whole, um, you know, search for, uh, you know, the history of musicians and gay bars and that sort of thing. And that was, we were able to hook that into what we said earlier was the main thesis of the book, which is that, uh when you oppress queer people, they come up with new forms of art. And you, when you couldn't get musicians to play in gay bars, we look at what lip syncing is now. Look at what the what a cultural force drag lip syncing is, and how that has spilled. Like, look at that, you know, lip sync battle. It has spilled into the mainstream, um, and all of that came out came about because musicians wouldn't play in uh, in gay bars. And that took a really, really long time to pull together as a concept and to come up with examples for it and everything. And um, from there, we opted to do a profile of Lipsinka and and elevate and show her as like the highest practitioner of the art form. The person who took it from being a silly little thing you did in gay bars and turned it into something you did in cabarets and you did on Broadway. Um, right. I mean, so much of our history was destroyed and hidden, you know, right. uh, it, it's very hard to go back and find these things. And, you know, it took us a long time. We had to go everywhere to find them. Thank God for the Internet. Otherwise, we'd be, as you mentioned, the Digital Transgender Archive. Right. right. There's exactly. another site called Queer Music Heritage, which is just uh, it's the same sort of the same thing as as uh, Digital Transgender Archive. And the other thing was to go on YouTube and search for obscure uh, cable access shows from the 70s. And you would get these obscure little San Francisco or New York cable access shows where there would be some interview with Divine from like 1976 or stuff like that. Um, 
that so our, our our research would lead us down all these weird alleyways, right. but uh, did, lip syncing was the hardest one yeah. for us to pull together. And we didn't want our research to turn into a Wikipedia page. You no, know, that's not what we wanted. We wanted to find things that would make them more personal, more you know, more like a real person, right? As opposed to just reading a, an entry uh, in a Wikipedia. So, just yeah. giving hints, hints, you know, here and there of, of something they did at a certain time in the past and then hopefully have a video or have some sort of uh, source to, you know, to back it up. Yeah, and that, that just goes back to the read the book with one hand so that you can go right. search and see Here we go back to one themselves. hand, doing something with one hand. <laughs> <laughs> so um, keeping an eye on the chat, we have a couple of other questions, if, if it's okay if we go past eight. Um, no, 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 no. Oh, yeah. and I just want to say I do love all the suggestions <laughs> here for our names. They're they're great. I love them. Love them all. <laughs> That's there's been I think my favorite so far is Bridget of Madison County. So uh, that was put in by Rick. Rick, I'm <laughs> definitely stealing that to impress my gay friends later. <laughs> they're great. They're great. Yeah. Uh, um. So there was a question about writing the book together as opposed to the blog. Right. And there was also a question about how do you write a book and keep the blog going? So how did you mm -hmm. balance that together? How'd you do it? Well, we actually did announce that we were going to be pulling back on the blog during the bulk of the book writing, which we did. Um, we didn't stop blogging because it's our, you know, it's our bread and butter. It's how we make our money. But we, oh, I don't know, for about four or five months during the, uh, the book was actually written in a very short period of time. It was written about in about six months. Because we, we had a, a deadline. So right Well, we had a deadline because the title was The First Decade of RuPaul's Drag Race, and it was going to come out like on the 11th anniversary, more or less. But um, we just pulled back. We pulled back on coverage. We at the, when we're really busy, it's it's hard to remember because the last year plus we've had a hard time pulling content together. But in a normal year, we post something like 60 to 75 posts a week. And uh, I think during the writing of the book, we were doing like 40 posts a week. Yeah. So and it was it was a lot of work. I mean, and a lot of research. I remember going to bed and Tom would be up all night with all the lights on, yeah. you know, typing away. I mean, it's a lot of work. Yeah. It, it's it's and nonstop because, but the great thing about this book is that we're very passionate about the topic. Um, and so we just love doing it. And, uh, and, and just, just such a wonderful uh, subject to be part of, you know, right. to be able to tell that story. So that made it more fun and, and less stressful. I miss writing the book right. actually. And the research. I miss about the research being on the totally entrenched in our history like that and spending hours and hours and hours on YouTube watching videos and stuff or on the uh, transgender archive and reading old because there were old drag magazines like from the 60s called F female mimics and they were like trade magazines for drag queens and you can go read them all online they're amazing and I do I, I actually miss being in we're working on another book proposal now it's not queer related right. and it's fun I love doing the research but it's not as as enriching as it was just being swimming through those waters for for close to a year doing research all right i think i picked mine someone said flotation device i love that i think that's my name <laughs> i love that uh and somebody said that one of the best names is, is uh karen from uh what is it from the office what is karen from uh, finance karen, karen from finance. finance oh my god that is the best name i mean it's such a great name <laughs> And uh, let's see. So we're getting com compliments on the book. People are saying that they really enjoyed all of the the research that went into it. And you can really, like I said, for as a historian, I read a lot of gay stuff, and this is exceedingly well sourced. Um, oh, thank you. And, oh, you're welcome. Um, and so we had a couple of questions. I had a question, one for each of you in the chat that sort of floated by a while ago. One was, Tom, what's your favorite comic of all time? You mentioned being a comic fan. <laughs> Single issue or oh geez, this um, is like asking. It's it's one of those I things. I mean, forty years of comics. I don't. I'm not sure I could give you one thing. I mean, if you find my favorite comic book title of all time is probably the Justice League. It was the first one I ever read, and I know everybody loves the Avengers, which is a Justice League ripoff. Um, but uh, for me, 
Um, oh something about those characters really spoke to me as a little boy. Uh, the the sort of square jawed hero- heroism, the sort of godhood like characters, you know, and it was Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman. It was all the big names. Uh, and to this day, I still love I still love a really well written Justice League comic book. So that would probably be me. Oh yeah, he can go on and on I and can. on about. I mean, sort of like sort of like Wonder Woman. Are you kidding <laughs> oh me? Oh my God, he is the number one fan. Yeah, yeah, Wonder Woman. Yeah. All right. What's the, the what's... next book? The the question for Lorenzo was about oh, wow. um about international mail in the 1980s, and um oh where was it? it was exactly it was about like what did you think of the uh influence it had on culture of the time I believe. I'm scrolling and scrolling back. Yeah, what did it? Yeah, yeah. What did it do culturally and personally, if anything? Philip oh my asks. god, international mail was my. Um, let's start with my porn number one. I mean, because it was it was my way of bringing a magazine into the house and say, well, I'm I'm here, you know, I have it for the fashion, but of course I had it for the man. Uh, so it was. I mean, I remember getting the magazine and, and buying stuff. My God, I can't believe I bought stuff. Uh, but uh, but it was all about the man. And it was just this safe way of looking at men, you know, um, without having to explain too much. You know, if I had the magazine around, um, you know, I would just say, well, I love fashion, you know, and that's what well, I have. It was in the 90s. International mail was probably a, a pretty, uh, not probably, it was a pretty powerful gateway drug to, yes. to gay male desire, to queer male desire. Yeah. Um, because it, it it's similar to the physique magazines of the 1950s. It, it passed itself off as a mainstream, right. uh, you know, fashion catalog, which it was, but it also dealt heavily in queer male erotic imagery. Right. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of the underwear p- portions of it were just one step up from pornography, oh, you know, because they were selling like see-through underwear. Um, I mean, and, and then so it, I'm sorry, but it really was actually very important. I don't think young queer people today can understand. No. Uh, we didn't have the ubiquity of porn now. The fact that we can look up porn on our telephones now, telephones on our phones. Um <laughs> But, you know, if you were young, if you were a teenager coming to terms with your own desire, same sex desires, like sometimes that that would land in your mailbox and you would sneak it up to your bedroom yeah. and it would become your little I mean, international gateway drug. Yeah. I mean, I had classes and then I would hear some and I'm like, all right, now we're talking. You know? It was just these great magazines that it was our way of looking at man, you know, in a more erotic way without having to explain too much. Yep, and we, we see in the chat folks are talking about Sears, about JC Penney. Yes, JC Penney. All, of that, stuff. all um, of that stuff. Yeah. The underwear then, section. The underwear section. My God. I mean, that's, you know, safe born. And Raul, who uh, mentioned, mentions that uh, International Mail, supposedly there's a documentary in the works. Raul yeah, is, that. is the historian of the hanky code. So I see you here, Raul, even though you just moved to Chicago. Um, so yeah, well, awesome. And that there was one other question in the chat, uh, and folks are kind of just talking now, but about uh, what was your first gay bookstore? And I'm kind of curious, what was your first gay, you know, place that wasn't a bar that you, you know, found culture in? Now that we do that online with each other, um, you know, I'll give a very honest answer here because I came of age in the 1980s. My first exposure to true gayness was uh, going to porn shops. Um, I was a 15 year old who could pass as a 21 year old. And I was able to, I mean, I'm being honest here about this because I know for a fact that this is not unusual for Gen X and baby boomer uh, men, gay men, that um, for a lot of us, our first real entry into queer culture was through queer erotica, if not porn. Um, that was my, that is how I understood, came to under, listen, I can tell you, I was 13 years old. Uh, I worked, I can't believe I had a job at 13, but this was in like 1980. Um, I worked at a, like a corn, like a bodega in my parent, in my parents' neighborhood and they stocked porn because it was then, you know, it was 1980 and I had to stock the porn shelves and it was, um, I want to say mandate magazine or inches <laughs> magazine. <laughs> and I was stocking the shelves and it said it had like a tagline or a logo line that said something like entertainment for the gay male or something like that. And 
that was my moment. That was when I was like, oh, that's what I am. Because I didn't care about the Playboy magazines I was stocking. I cared about these. So I have no problem admitting that, that my entry into my understanding of myself as a gay man uh, and my entry into gay culture was entirely through pornography. And I don't think that's at all unusual, especially for my generation. Yeah, I think mine was books. Like I remember reading Giovanni's room for the first time and and I couldn't believe that I was actually reading about two men. Um, Stuff like that. I think I think that, you, you know, you're so surprised that, you know, you actually reading a story of a, a book published about, you know, homosexual, uh, you know, uh, situation. <laughs> um, but you know, and, it, and it's interesting because I do remember reading uh, Giovanni's Room. And then later, you know, here in Philadelphia, we had a bookstore, a gay bookstore called Giovanni's, called Giovanni's Room, Room yeah. which was fantastic. So that's one part that I miss is the gayborhoods. Um, I understand why they're not necessary you know quote unquote necessary anymore uh but it was it was a place where you could go and then you could find everything gay possible in one store and uh you could also cruise see people you know it was just like yeah when i was like 13 i used to go to the gayborhood here in philadelphia um and it was the first time i saw men in leather on the street it was the first time i saw drag queens And I'm going to be real here. It was, again, it was the early 1980s. It was, uh, I saw men on the street who were clearly very ill. And, um, you know, like a lot of Gen X gay men, that that combination of factors, that combination of pornography and men dying in front of you, the uh, the ease with which you could get pornography, you know, and the fact that, uh, you know, men were visibly dying on the streets. uh, It's... It shaped a lot of Gen X gay men. It shaped a lot of us. Right. So I don't think I'm unusual in that respect. I'm so, reading all the. I'm I'm smiling because I'm reading all the comments here. They're they're sweet. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, and that's I I sort of actually I, I kind of want to wrap us up around that that um, sort of point about seeing seeing culture taking part in culture. Um, learning about community and learning about, you know, the realities of it. It's not just shiny porn mags and, and cruising. It's everything else that goes along with being a queer person. And it is wild to think that there are people coming up now who their first foray is RuPaul's Drag Race. That there, as you mentioned, there are queens like uh, Ellie Diamond, Aquarian, Mm -hmm. yes, Um, Gottmik, who are saying, you know, these are some of the first times I saw you know, something that I wanted to be right. on television. Whereas, you know, when I was a kid, we had Ellen, maybe, yeah, right, eventually. Right. We wow, had Ellen for a short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. I, can't, I can't explain our excitement when we watched the first episode of Drag Race. That meant so much to us. We couldn't believe that we were actually watching that on TV. We said in our first recap of the show, of the first episode, that it was, um, and it, it was at the time, not so much anymore. The um, the closest television had ever gotten to showing what uh, queer male social spaces were like. What it what happens when you put a bunch of queer men in a room together? Well, we all start making dick jokes and glory hole jokes, and and that's what you saw on the workroom. And we would right. sit there in two thousand nine and be like, oh "My God, I can't believe they're making jokes about glory holes on right. TV!" Like I never thought I would see that world. Um, so yeah, there was this great excitement when the show first aired that we were seeing. Uh, you know, because prior to that, it was like freaking Will and Grace and nothing, you know, no tea, no shade against that show. It it did a lot of good. But I can tell you, I I never saw myself in that show. And I, I think that's true of a lot of gay men. Um, but from the and I've never done drag in my life. But from the first episode of Drag Race, it's like, wow, I, I can see my this is the kind of stuff we joke about when we're with our friends on Fire Island every yeah, summer. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is the kind of these are the kind of conversations we have. I mean, it was so raw. And, and you look at the mini challenge, especially, you know, is where they just go and do something fun and 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 silly. And that is so much of our community. Yep. Uh, we love it. We absolutely love it. And, you know, it has changed. Uh, the changes were necessary. And I think for the best. Um, and you know, and it, that's why the show is keeps going, you right? Know, because it is important. Um, and I've, I've, I've 
read so many emails and I've talked to so many people, not just queer people, like straight people interested in the show and enjoying the show and seeing themselves in the show. Right. Um, In that kind of, you know, quote unquote freedom to be whatever they want to be. And I think a lot of straight people understand that and and, and appreciate that uh, as well. So it's not just the queer community. The show is good for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's helping straight people. It's it's it normalizes things in a way, right? Yeah, and right. and that's for for better or worse sometimes because as you've mentioned and as we all know, there's so much work that we need to do to support trans members of our community, to support Black and Indigenous people of color, queer and trans people, especially within our community across right. the country and the world. Um, but I can say on a personal level, my mother, who when I came out was like, I don't need to know. It's fine loves drag race watches it for hours and then is you know starts gossiping about well so and so did this and so and so did that and how does oh what was her name on the first season from las vegas um uh no. chanel no, yes my mother who i'm probably gonna have to show this recording to later uh was like how is her ass like that <laughs> look at that and had never seen anything like that on television before uh. so Anyway, that's my personal connection to Drag Race. Um, and yeah, I will say, I'm, I'm going to close this out. Folks are saying lots of really lovely things. I in know, the chat, I, can and see I, I know. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. I see you there. Thank you. Okay. I will um, make sure to send you to the transcriptions so that you can see all this, all this lovely feedback people are oh, sending. Oh, that's sweet. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. And I just want to say again, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. It has absolutely been my pleasure. The time has flown by. It has. Yeah. I know. It was just like so, it went really so fast. much fun. Yeah. yeah. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone in the audience for sticking around. I know. Thank you so much. All of you. All of you. Thank you so much. I mean, we do appreciate that. And thank very you for much. having us. Yes. This was a true honor. And a yeah. pleasure. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. you guys and are awesome. Thank you. And so you can find the History Project at historyproject.org. We can find Tilo at, is it TomandLorenzo.com? Yes, it right. is. Yep, there we go. So um, come find us, come check out what we're up to because similarly, I think we're both very busy with the end of Pride Month right now. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thank you yes. so much for being here. Thank you, it was thank our pleasure. So and thank you so much to all of you guys who came. Thank you. We're thank so you. touched that you yes, all we really listened are. to us. Yes. Uh, but thank you again. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Yeah, have a great night. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>